Hello, everyone, and welcome to Bios and Bookmarks, episode number six, an online reading series with Caribbean authors powered by the NGC Focus Lit Fest. I am Shivani Ramluchan, and it is my great honor today to be speaking with an author who is no stranger to the NGC Bocas Lit Fest. I, I would describe him as a friend of the festival. In both word and song, this is Anthony Joseph, poet, musician, man of many hats, let's face it. Anthony, welcome, and it's a real yeah. pleasure to be talking with you today. Hi, yeah, thank you, thank you, it's a real pleasure. So everyone, yeah. Anthony is the author of several books. You may be familiar with his most recent, I say fiction, but it's it's a marriage of genres, really, which is a book preceding the one we'll be discussing today. And that book was, of course, Kitsch. And for those of you who were present at our festival a couple years ago, would have had the true delight of hearing Anthony and his cadre of musicians do a musical rendition from Kitsch, which frankly, Anthony remains one of my festival highlights. It was mm -hmm. such a special, special event. Today, we are gonna be speaking with Anthony about his newest publication. It's brand new, also from People Tree Press called The Frequency of Magic. It is a genre-defying meta-narrative, which involves, on the one hand, a man who has been deep in the production of a book that is his masterpiece for many years, and on the other, takes a look at the people within the scenes, not just behind the scenes of this book, but its active and living characters who decide in their own stages and phases to take the life of the novel into their own hands. It is a book unlike any I've read before, and I'm really excited to invite Anthony to share a reading from the Frequency of Magic. So Anthony, whenever you're ready. Okay, okay. I think uh, I'm gonna start with the first chapter because that kind of sets the scene kind of to what comes after. So, yeah, as you were saying, it's about a guy uh, called Raphael who's writing a book. He's been writing it for 41 years. Chapter one. Raphael had been writing a novel for 41 years. On a cedar table in his house of water and his house of chairs, amongst ornaments, trinkets, and books lay his papers. But distractions were plentiful. The bull cow would ramble, the sour cherry would bear fruit, the madman would jump, the ravine would need to be cleared. So he wrote in the latrin, away from the dissonance of the million hills, secluded in the stink of shit amongst the deep hurling scent of ammonia and the banks of dank moss where, where women stooped to leg of water. Moan, papa moan, and write your book. But bugs, bees, and red ants want to bite the man out. The drake duck grunts. The deacon rings the bell in the church hid in the bush. A phone keeps ringing in the falling down house. The mongoose chases the hairy snake. The Baptist mother delays her Thanksgiving service to cuss somebody upside down. So even in the shit house, things came to inveigle and addle the old man's brain, to distract him from, his, from the seriousness of his craft. After 41 years, the novel's characters were understandably restless. Some were elderly and others were dead. Some like Vince and Giveaway, who as boys would pitch marbles in the riverbeds of the imagined city, had simply faded into spaces between words. Ramdas went to shoplift, got caught and heart attacked right there in the shop when police hold him. Tom Denny, a turnkey, got fired for pushing weed. And Luke, who Raphael put in a surreal Caribbean Western, get damn vexed one day and ride out like a thief with his nemesis, the great bandit, riding close behind. Raphael was a butcher. He lived alone high in the million hills, past the wooden nursing home and the credit union. From there, the island spread out below. There was a boy, 
a relative from a village on the flatlands beneath the hill who was learning to blow a flute he had carved himself from grief and bamboo. He wore short khaki pants, had a copper scented head, was awkward and reticent, but he would sit with Raphael on the veranda silently overlooking the jungles of the rainforest and the deep well of ours. Beyond lay the still dark sea and beyond this, the edge of the known world. The maps of their world had been drawn by eminent cartographers who had underestimated the island size. At the fireside by night, Raphael and the boy roasted cashew beans. Then they sat in silence. Soon this boy too would grow and spin from the old man's hand to leave the hill, to blow and to write his own life. Even Ella, Deacon's daughter, whom Raphael had known as a girl among the lilies and rills which ran from the higher parts of the hill, sought her ambition elsewhere. The book, like the island, was too small for her dreams. So between the page and the turning, she too left the book at the foot of the million hills. Raphael remained in his room, rubbing Bayram on his knees, writing and rewriting the same movements, then months later, the concluding sentences of some great chapter. Raphael told the boy tales of hunting in the hills, of working on cargo ships as a young sailor, and how every morning he would rise and fire a rum to start the day. How then he was handsome like a bitch. His working papers were tattered palimpsest. They had been written on over and over again, the original text hidden within the ink and flutter. Sometimes Raphael would read from his novel, Though the boy could not understand how its multiple stories could occur simultaneously. But the characters in their impatience broke needles under Raphael's fingernail. They penetrated his brain with complaints. Then his wife died. Cancer tore into the sponges of her lungs. Tumorous polyps filled them, bursting like grapes in a supermarket, where as a young man, Raphael once had a summer job and deliberately broke grapes as he packed customers' bags. In his white shirt and soft pants, this was his protest against the engines of commerce. One day, when hunger held him, he stole a tin of Viennese sausages. His crime was witnessed by a cashier who told, and the manager, Mr. Gary, called Raphael up to his office and fired him, saying, Raph boy, you know what have to happen now, eh? Raphael built himself a tough chapel to write in. He built the soak away first and then the latrine, where the galvanized stuck, into, stuck like roots into the bug ridden mud. His notebook was held open on his knees while flies buzzed around his, his heels and head like constellations. But the rain beat him to a print, a vehicle skidded and overturned on a rugged Tobago road. The minister was caught masturbating on a rock behind the school. The pie man was strangled with a shoelace till candle wax dripped out his nose. A parrot cussed and was arrested and charged. The lizard hid in the Malomer bush. In his neighbor's house, there were black instruments for breaking hymens. The mad woman turned into a black bird and fell burning from the power line. The one-eyed fish went totally deaf. The book would overwhelm him at, at times. It wouldn't listen. The characters had become unruly, ungrateful, deceitful, bottle break, table turnover. Then fragmentation of the text and his leaking eye at night by paraffin lamplight. People fighting, cussing, some grinning like crapple when the man trying to write. It's like the damn book was writing him. But when he spoke about the book, even Mr. Crapple would come and sit down on Big Stone to hear him talk. It was to be an important book. Raphael had put all his belly and his stones into it. It would be Sue Generi, his legacy. It was called The Frequency of Magic. Each chapter was precisely 1,000 words long. So, um, I don't know if you want me to read a bit more, Shivani, let me know. 
I would love a little bit more if you are. All right. That's cool. Just one sec. Let me close this door. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about the, I guess, the, the theory or whatever, the construction of the book. Um, but yeah, each chapter is a thousand words long. And the stories are kind of run simultaneously. There's all sorts of different strands of stories, storylines happening. One of those stories concerns a guy called Luke, who is kind of what we call in Trinity, the star boy. He's one of the star boys. Um, and Luke is being pursued by a guy called the, called the Great Bandit, who believes that Luke knows everything that's going to happen in this book. So his theory is that if Luke knows everything that's going to go on, if I catch Luke, and force him to tell me how the story goes. I could avoid my own demise because I'm the bad guy and I know the bad guy is gonna, is gonna die. So if I catch this guy, I can find out what's gonna happen. I could evade my own demise. So he's chasing Luke all over the world. Well, all over the world of the book. Um, so this is a chapter a little bit further in where Luke has arrived at a particular town trying to escape the, the bandit and the bandit is coming close behind. Chapter 22. Luke had now left Mont Garnet and was on his way to Mad Bull Hill. He hoped that when he was called upon in that decisive moment, when men are tested and astonish themselves in, com in conflict, he too would step up to battle with his fist hot and his big heart open, ready to throw his hand. He knew that when Basil came, he would come suddenly. And there's a footnote to Basil, personification of the big man himself. Basil is the grim reaper, the king of terrors, hailstone and sorrow, when I dared bury my clothes. For more info, see the mighty dictator. I don't know why the devil I can't get fat, 1948, and destroyer. Leave me alone, Dorothy, 1940, winner. And Melchior say, when Basil bowl you out, you can't put no leg before wicket. You have to walk back to the pavilion. You're bound to go. Luke was no longer afraid. He watched a young soldier step out of a taxi. The soldier walked upon the earth with a fearless grip, and Luke was empowered by this vision. He knew then that no engine or plot could grind him to blush. He had traveled across rough waters and perilous rocks. He had been bitten by sandfly, marabonta, titsy fly, and mites more bitey than the raised welts from the bandit's cut-ass belt. And if he find himself in the desert, what they ask they put him there for, uh, besides to crack some jackass carapace with licks. And there's a footnote to that. Please remember, is suffer Luke suffer and suffer when he drift away from the text and cultivate hunger in the desert. He thought he could flex. He feel he could defy what the big man put down in writing. But he almost did and was ready for Kobo to suck out the eye by the time he ring the bell upon the bandit's perilous gate. You must be feel the bandit sent for Luke by saying he had bush meat by the gallon. But nobody em make Luke come here. Luke come here for himself. Luke could not be sure if his memories were his to have or someone else's written into historical prose and verse. But he remembered being taken from a soft bed and dragged down the hill, screaming for love in the hot afternoon, torn from his mother's arms. The telling and the who, he never grew weary of hearing it, was the same for everything and everyone upon that hill. From the weak-hearted deacon sanding crook sticks Onto the fisherman skanking to dub roots rockers with his trousers rolled up to his knees in the community hall, where too bad DJ would clash and rib would, would rattle from bass. Never mind overright or verbosity, haul your ass with that. Every soul cage carries its own sorrow with it. It is hard to keep up with a place where everything happening at the same time. And feel this. Walking in the street, Luke would suddenly forget who he was. He would wonder if his consciousness was his or if ultimately he was alone 
that he would leave alone with both hands swinging, no duty-free chocolate or rum, no sugar cake or tulum, no gift to bring for nobody. Luke entered Mad Bull Hill sideways like a crab climbing the side of a muddy precipice behind people's house. But all around still post and pillar, walking soft where men piss in passing, where the earth moist and rancid, cool breeze don't heal it. The last house he passed on his way uphill was where his father had laid his head and convalesced after his car overturned on a hot Tobago highway, where he had a comfort woman sat his brow when sap his sap his brow with bay rum and fed and feed him from chicken foot soup. This woman had Creole blood with a rounded Taino face. She was humble but proud. Her shoulders were straight, with muscle built from carrying buckets of water and children up hills and rocky ocean sides. Her breasts, too, were filled with muscle from pulling up tubers, cassava, and tanya but one one cocoa that's full up basket. And she established her own furniture business and put the first brick house up on Mad Bull Hill. Luke's father had met her at the Bagatelle Parish Fair in the field between the bamboo and the river. That country afternoon, when with the luscious balm of gospel, the leader of the church went walking through the fair, shaking hands. The woman bent nice, to dish him turtle prick soup from her pot as he passed. People from a long line, everybody see her heart. Luke father by a cup, the reader could negotiate the rest. There were men sitting around the fire on Mad Bull Hill, roasting some chenet seeds over flame till black and charred the knot inside hot like newborn wood. Luke sat with them and saw that each had exactly the same black face, which glowed in the rippling blaze. From that hill, the entire history of the island was revealed. The lights of the jetty, the hotels, refineries, the marinas, Legion Hall, the colors blazing in the mass camps, the audacity of Baptist churches singing down the hill with hymns to burst the center post. The holy room where neophytes mourned, mothers humming down Ezekiel Jitney. Look, the woman catch the power and roll, so you peep the holy pleat. These were all familiar strokes. At the airport, the great bandit had just stepped off the plane. He carried his suitcase in the old style by the wrist, not on wheels or hip on his back, but holding hard the grip with its plastic handle. His bulk would grow his good time waste. He hid his eyes behind dark shades and he was chewing several sticks of black mint gum, ready to bitch and squall. In times of danger, the great bandit could become deceptive and vicious. He carried malice in his heart and razor blades in his wallet, undetected by x-ray or fast camera. He was on his way to intercept Luke, to decipher his hex, to twist and clip the hero's wings with jealous, possessive love. He walked with the bow-legged movement of a Mexican film star in those Western movies in which the hero died and the villain was undefeated and left the damn film still malicious and hard to dead. Like a midnight rubber burning down house and caliphate. But every time he bent his arms, the thick skin on his elbows cracked like red rocks of lava. Strip the bandit naked and he turned wrestler. Growl how he wanted to eat people raw, to suck out the marrow from the bone. He acts for Luke in the government printry. In this town, each department had its own department and each, uh, each, each department of civil ceremony had a building. And they show him a map of Mad Bull Hill. And in that map, he see Luke sitting down around the fire with the same faced men. And when Luke look up and he see the bandit watching, he reach up to turn the page and run. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that tremendous reading. That's cool. Yeah. And, um, you know, the frequency of magic is mm -hmm. As I said before you read, unlike any book I've encountered before, 
And mm -hmm. since you mentioned in between your readings, the, the form of the book, the shape that it takes and the mm -hmm. intention that it makes structurally on the page, I think that's a great place to start because the book itself tells us it has its own conceit, if you will, yeah. that yeah. each chapter will be exactly a thousand words. And what I yeah. was curious about was in the process of hammering each chapter into that shape, were there mm -hmm. elements or poetries or fictions you felt being culled? And, and if so, was there a way to work those narratives back into the text? Mm. Well, um, oh, that's a good question. I think um, because for me, the writing of the book uh, is the, you know, getting the first drafts out is always, I guess, um, it's always a, like, uh, uh, it's not the real shaping of a book. You know, you get it out, you get the raw material out, and then you spend, I mean, I spent years editing, and I love the editing process. So a lot of stuff becomes, you have this huge mass of text, you know. Um, like a lot of people say, you know, a novel is a place that you put all your ideas and all your memories and all your philosophies, especially like your early novels, you put so much into it. So it's the same. I have this whole constellation of ideas and philosophy going around and each of them kind of fit in a place. They don't always fit in the place you expect them, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff that I cut out. Like, because I think as a poet, a lot of things are images and lines or metaphors or just a, a snapshot or something that fits later on or mm -hmm. sometimes gets repeated you know so yeah there's that element of of cutting and filling in and shaping this huge jigsaw puzzle you know but at the end of it I mean the feeling for me was that you know I've said all I had to say everything that's there is what I wanted to be I was pretty happy with what was left you know, you know there, there's a way in which Raphael tells us early on that this work is to be his sui generis his mm -hmm the the pinnacle of, of his not just what he hopes his life will end up representing but the thing that he yeah. has pressed with his own with the work that makes money the, the all that he has done and That's right. been done and mm -hmm. a, a cheeky question i want to ask you mm -hmm. is if you feel the same about this book i mean you're a prolific writer, but there's no mistake when when you come to the space of the frequency of magic that it feels mm -hmm. like a very immediate and passionate labor of a book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is your journey at all similar to Raphael's? Um, well, I mean, it hasn't taken me 41 years to write a book. So no, but um, you know, for me, I mean, the, the book was really about, you know, celebrating a Trinidadian, a Trinidadian identity, a Trinidadian memory. You know, I've been here since 89 now. I spent, you know, my formative years in Trinidad. And I find myself, you know, writing a lot about Trinidad, you know, even though I've lived here in, in London more than I lived in Trinidad. So I guess it was a place to put all of that stuff in, to put all of that, all of those ideas. Um, I don't think that, uh, Raphael and me are the same are the same person, although you know they're elements, they're definitely elements. But um, I definitely feel that it was a this for me, this book is a culmination of a lot of things. It's a culmination of, of that particular way of looking back to Trinidad, looking back, looking back. Um, I don't think that looking back is over, but this was definitely the fullest statement that I've made on you know, growing up in Trinidad and language, the language that we use, you know, it's a celebration for me of the language that we use in Trinidad. Raphael is different to me in that Raphael is in the middle of the space. He's in the space in which he's writing about. He's, he lives on this place called Million Hills. And a lot of what he's experiencing, he's writing into the book and bringing everything in. Um, I don't actually write like that. You know, I'm always looking outside of where I am. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit of a difference there. Yes, definitely. And I am, I would be the first to say, I'm glad it did not take 41 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes I guess, you know, each book that you write, I'm sure for you is the same, you know, your life, your whole life leads up to a book, you know, you, you spend your life writing the same book, you know, um, books don't just come about just out of nowhere, you know, it's experience, isn't it? It's a life. So, you know, okay. absolutely. Uh 
we have a question here from Alana Marie, who is our social media assistant, and she would like to know, well, first she says, this is fascinating. Which ended up moving the writing along more for you, the characters or the structure? Um, both, uh, you know, it's hard because I, the way I started it was, oh gosh, how do I, how do I, how do I explain this? Many years ago when I first started, um, working with surrealism and surrealist techniques i did this thing where i would get up i would write every day and i would write until i got into a state of trance you know and i did that every day and every day if you do that for like six months every day you you definitely get to a place where you're really in tune with where you're writing but i left that and i started writing like a lot of people write where you wait for something to inspire you to write and i did that for many years. And one day I was like, you know what? I want to go back to that space I was in where everything was flowing organically, where I was writing every day and where I would write something in the morning and then it would happen later on in the day and it would like be mind boggling and time would be shifting and everything. So I started doing that again. And also there's this thing that uh, I tell my students that if you want to write a novel, all you got to do is write a thousand words a day. If you write a thousand words a day for 80 days, you end up with 80,000 words. You don't quite end up with a novel, but it give, gives you the basis of it. So I started doing that myself. I said, you know, I'm going to write a thousand words, a thousand words. So in a lot of ways, to answer the question, the discipline mm -hmm. of sticking to a thousand words was what kept me going. The discipline of writing a thousand words every day until I became like Raphael, I guess, trying to get this done a thousand words. I mean, there were some days I wrote more than a thousand words, of course, but the discipline and then soon after I'd been writing for, I don't know, four, three or four months, the characters began to emerge, people like Luke and the bandit. And I fell in love with them and they just kind of pushed me forward, you know, um, even Ella, you know, the actress in there. Yeah. So the characters, once they became part of the writing, everyday writing process, I had to finish it. I had to complete it. I had to get to a point where their stories were told, you know. Absolutely. Uh, so for everyone just joining us, welcome again to Bios and Bookmarks. This is our online reading series with Caribbean authors powered by the NGC Bocas Lit Fest. We're talking today with Anthony Joseph, who is a great friend of the festival and no stranger to the world, not only of Caribbean literature, but of Caribbean music and thought and many other realms. And we are discussing today his newest novel, The Frequency of Magic, published by People Tree. Uh, Anthony, we have a question here from Marta Fernandez Campo. And Marta would like to know, does music, how does music influence the composition and the writing? And she says, thank you for this great discussion and reading. Hmm. Well, uh, I, came to, I came to writing through music um, when I started writing, I was like writing poetry. I was probably about 11 years old, um, just moving into secondary school. And, I, and that around that time, I was discovering reggae and I was discovering, you know, shadow. I was listening to a lot of Calypso, a lot of music in general, really became really interested in music and lyrics. And I started um, working, trying to write my own lyrics, essentially. And that's how I started writing poetry, by, kind of by accident. I never started off, I never really said, I'm going to write a poem. I said, I'm going to write a song. I'm going to write words, you know. And the poetry came out of that. So I guess music has always been at the heart of that sensibility for me. I, I consider myself a poet. And I think being a poet is, you know, is being a musician. Music, uh, poetry is, is spoken music, you know, if you want. So, yeah, music is always the main thing. Um, and the way it works for me is that the the page becomes a score in the same way that a musician works with, you know, you open with a particular flourish or particular chord or you go through a particular melody and then it resolves itself. For me, it's the same. I think for a lot of poets, we have that feeling that a, a poem is like a song and it, then it ends in a place where you feel mm, that last note mm -hmm. is the note, you know, and it's a res it resonates and there's sound involved in it. In the mm -hmm. same way a musician works, with sound. So yeah, you know, um, music for me. And also I guess with this book, um, probably more than the other books, 
there was this idea of, of ham, what Ornette Coleman calls homolotics, in which you have a situation where everyone is improvising at the same time, but resolving at a particular point. So it sounds like a whole, it sounds complete, even though everyone's improvising at the same time. If they're getting together at certain points, certain intervals, and playing the same thing in unison, it begins to make sense. So I kind of, I'm going off script a bit, but yeah, that's, yeah, music is important. <laughs> I, I think that like any true improvisational musical genius, you answered that perfectly. So oh, thank you. <laughs> so not for nothing, but the, the figure of Anthony Joseph as a writer yeah. is no stranger to the book as well. His, his <laughs> are, they are footnoted in the novel. Yeah. There, there are references to Birdhead Sun, to the yeah. African origins of UFOs, to, to the work that, that has built your career and, and, and the, the poems and, and other writing into the universe. What's it like, this, this kind of meta-narrative technique of putting yourself <laughs> in the novel? And then, because, you know, it's easy enough to say it's a maneuver of ego, but that's not the impression yeah. at all, that that's yeah. not happening at the level of construction in the book. So yeah. what is what is that? I don't know. Um, I've always admired metafiction. You know, I've always admired. Um, I remember years ago reading Ishmael Reed, mm -hmm. and he's got a book. He's got a book. I think it's called Turning Japanese or Japanese by Spring. I think it's called, in which he's uh, he's talking about a, a university somewhere, and there's a lecture going on, and the, the students are getting ready to go and sit in this lecture, and one of the students is saying, "Yeah." There's some guy called Ishmael Reed who's doing a lecture. And I thought that was fascinating. And, you know, it's always, it's always, it's always uh, felt like something I wanted to try. And I think this book, The Frequency, gave me the opportunity to do that because this is not a book that I've written. It's not my book. Raphael is writing this book. So once that kind of became an idea for me and a concept that it wasn't me that was writing this, this was Raphael, then I became just an author, you mm -hmm. know. And there's a few of my friends are appear in there. Malika Booker is in there. Malika found herself and texted me one time and said, oh, I found myself in your book. And um, Roger Robinson is in there as well. Yeah, there's a few people in there. You know, I, I, like, I like playing around with that, with those multiple layers of, of kind of reality, you know? It's like an infinite mirror. You're in the book, but you're reading the book at the same time. Yeah, I, yeah. And, um... Yeah. It's a playful text. It's also a vicious one. There are, there are moments yeah. in reading the work when the, the pure viscerality of it, it completely sideswipes you. Mm. And, and I think this is a book that makes you work towards many purposes. So mm. its ambitions are polyvocal, much like your career and, and your service in the arts. And so my, my next question is about what it asks of you as a writer and a musician to make this kind of brutality and then juxtapose it with images of great beauty. Mm. What kind of things did you feel were being asked of you in that creation process? Mm. Well, um, you know, I grew up in Trinidad, you know, when you grew up in Trinidad, you see some stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you experience some stuff and it's a space of, it could often be a space of raw, it's, there's an element of rawness in a Trinidadian childhood, at least for me. You know, I saw a lot of stuff. I saw a lot of stuff that, you know, my kids wouldn't want to see, for instance, um, and heard about a lot of things happening, you know, I had a lot of experiences which involve the physicality, the body, you know, the decay of the body, illness, death accidents you know so a lot of that um unfortunately or fortunately i guess ended up in the work and it still is and i feel um there's a kind of muscularity involved in writing about things like that you you have to be you have to feel confident enough to to, to present it in a way that's that's real and muscular and i i, I enjoy that i enjoy that space that it brings me in um it's not. It's definitely not a celebration of, of these things, but it's a, it's an honest 
examination of it and it's an honest display of it and it's displaying certain really difficult moments in a poetic way you know giving beauty to to unfortunate things that happen to people you know mm -hmm. um or humor you know i think being a trinidadian as well I mean, that's the other thing you know it, it, we have a way of making really traumatic things funny we have a way of of saying something describing trauma or you know in a way that that is funny you know which kind of dulls it dullens the blade a little bit it dulls the blade of it uh, and I like playing with that. I like that absurdity where you could push things to a, set, a certain level of, of absurdity, you know, where violence becomes absurd, where, where decay becomes absurd. And, you know, I think in the book, everyone, everyone suffers, you know. Yes. But in a, but in a poetic way, you know. It's, you know, we, we begin with Raphael, certainly, and we're led into the lives of other people and at no point does any character, no matter how seemingly minor, yeah. ever feel incidental to the plot. You get the sense, spending time with the frequency of magic, that you get the full span of these people's lives, their vexations, their, their eroticisms, their quarrels. Even if we see a character for a flash of an instant. Yeah. Uh, fullness of lives butting up yeah. against each other makes this work feel incredibly real yeah 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 that's definitely that's true and that's well observed that is something that i learned i learned that from lovelace i learned that from lovelace um i think his work does that as well i think when you read when you read salt or when you read dragon you get a sense of a community you know you don't get a sense of a particular one particular hero going through stuff that people are following and shining a light on it you get a sense of a community um, and that's definitely something that informed me and this idea where you you sort of flatten the how do you say the hierarchy you, you, you know you it's a flat democratic hierarchy no one is more important than the other person uh, and that's why you get glimpses of everyone's life because everyone is valid and everyone is important so yeah that's that is true and that's a, a love lacian thing mm -hmm. yeah this is, you know, it makes me think because Loveless is mentioned in the book. Mm -hmm. There's a way in yeah. which there is such a, a reverence for the canon of, of writers, of, of griots, of Calypsonians, and they make their appearances mm -hmm. either in person or in reference in the book. And I yeah. find the insertion of the Anthony Joseph, the Malika Booker, the Roger Robinson into this same canon or alongside it is the yeah. most telling thing because here we yeah. have more than just a deification of the gods of our literature and our music mm -hmm. but also a sense that there's a continuity of the arts and it can all yeah. be a conversation with itself absolutely yeah for sure for sure for sure yeah i agree with that i mean we we have to we we have to find a way of bringing ourselves into that you know mm -hmm. uh, we have to find ourselves a, a way of we have to find ourselves in the, so in the canon you know in the history of the thing, we got to place ourselves there. Sometimes we got to do it ourselves, you know. Sometimes I got to put Malaika in here, or I got to put Roger in here, for people to to see them, you know. Yeah. We have so, a yeah. a great uh, comment and question here from Kelly Baker Josephs, who oh, asks, yeah. "Could you speak a bit to what you had to change about your process beyond the discipline of the one thousand words a day between mm -hmm. Kitsch?" and the frequency of magic, especially <laughs> given the wow. relationships of the two books to quote unquote reality. Were they written yeah. or were you working on them at the same time? Oh, wow. Um, actually, the, full, the story behind that is uh, um, I was uh, finishing my PhD and I kind of lost my way. I lost my sort of enthusiasm. I was writing, I mean, Kitsch was part of my PhD. Kitsch was the creative element of the PhD. So I was working on Kitsch and then I kind of lapsed. I kind of lost interest and I lost interest for a year. And in that time, I wrote the first draft of the frequency. So I was kind of working on them at the same time. It was kind of, kind of working on them at the same time, but more so um, frequency during that year. Um, in terms of what I had to change, well, you know, Kitsch was really 
about, I mean, although there are elements of my own life and my own experience in Kitsch, Kitsch was definitely about a community that was removed from my experience. You know, it was definitely a historical thing. I had to do a lot of research going back into life in Trinidad in the 40s and the 50s and stuff like that. So it felt very much like uh, an experiment in writing something that was really not about me. I wasn't involved in that text. Uh, in this, I had to focus more on my own memory and my own experiences and research my own memory. So yeah, there was that, that is what I think is the main difference. And I also think the, the style, you know, my, uh, the kitsch, when I was doing kitsch, my, one of my supervisors, uh, Blake Morrison was very, my PhD supervisors was like, you know, make this book accessible, you know, because I was making it, it was quite experimental at this. And he was like, you know, make it, make it accessible, make it a biography, make it accessible. So I kind of toned it down and wrote in a very, I guess, a very accessible direct way with this. I didn't, I just did what I wanted, you know, it was complete and utter freedom. Um, yeah, there was a sense of, you know, I'm sure a lot of writers feel that where you just don't care. Mm -hmm. And once you get to that point where you don't care, then you begin to really write well. You know? So it was, it was that for me, it was a different, different headspace. Kitsch was more, I got to get this right, because there's a responsibility as well behind Kitsch. It's such an iconic figure. You can't, can't mess it up. If you mess up a book about kitsch, Trini people will kill you. So, you know, I had to get that right in a lot of ways, uh, in, a, in ways that I didn't have to get this right. You know, I, all I had to do with this was to be honest. I love that. And, and thanks so much, Kelly. That's a, a brilliant contribution. I'm going to ask Anthony to read again for us because shockingly i don't know where the time has gone it has the time is obeying its own frequency of magic and it yeah. is. but um so just before i do that please there is still time to get your questions and, and comments in for anthony about this book or perhaps any of his others and anthony sir when you're ready please take it away yeah i'm just gonna read i'm gonna put my glasses on for this actually light is fading here great so yeah in trinidad we have a thing called uh grief milk which i don't know if everyone knows what that is but grief milk is is refers to when a woman well as far as it was explained to me when a woman has a has a a, a miscarriage and the miscarriage comes pretty late and the the milk is already developing in her breast and that's called grief milk that was at least what my grandmother told me. Chapter 51. I got to say some of this is, is raw stuff, you know? So if you, uh, I'm just looking, I don't think there's anything particularly too graphic, but you know, the odd thing might jump out. Just to warn you. Chapter 51. But this grief milk thing, But this grief mill thing, everyone know the suffer Elsie suffer under that house, eating dirt and matted hair and rags that ants bite up and toilet paper that wood slave or black and white salamander shit on chicken wine. They leave she down there to do her business. They leave Elsie down there to dead. It is July, 1965. Motocar still curvy. Fellas still wearing flannel peg pants. Woman still wearing calico dress. Sparrow come with steering wheel, Congo man, and Elsie down below that house in Barataria for two weeks now. From when her family bring her there after her one child dead at five years old and poor Elsie milk come in and burst. The milk stay full up her breast with no baby to feed, so it must water out to irrigate the world or to be squeezed into an elder's eye, to cleanse cataract or seep out sticky and white, or oh, gum, grief milk, they call this milk. When the milk turned to blood, Elsie crawl under that house and wouldn't come out. Down in the dirt, she grew a beard and ate so much dirt, her breast dried to wood. Who would be worried? Who would care? Who would dig Elsie out from under this tragedy? The old man washing his cock in the sink. The civil servant beating his alstations with a black police belt. 
the cousin who was a promising athlete until big books like The Losers Resume drove him mad. The woman upstairs in the Calypso ballroom in Shamsley grinding malice because her husband still seeing the same hardback woman that feeding him egg bread and green yam for 14 years. The bareback tailor sewing silver masquerade boots opposite the Royal Jail on Frederick Street. Who could tell you how dense with gallows cry some mornings this be? The cameraman, obsessed with taking photos of the old fort, the old port, the cathedral, the market with its fisheries scent. The same one who watching the young boy prick to plum and pick him out to skin him up on a hairy rock in short pants for photograph. The woman who escaped heavy poverty on the hill, who lived in a hole in the ground until she hooked up the heart of a German pensioner as a chambermaid at the Hilton Hotel and moved to Caracas with the old test. Later to glean, he was a wanted man with gun under bed and a criminal past in Germany. She never tell nobody, expecting long money. But it's just 32 Fats Domino albums he dead and leave her instead. Or the hundred-year-old aunt still grinding sugarcane with her teeth and shooing blue fly from a scar on her thigh that never healed, no. Not even the hard prick priest in the falling down church where people passing out from rhythm and heat. Not even the naval orange vendor on Can at Cantaro Junction who's selling sideways weed. Nor the Macomé, Fishman, Melchior, nor Cousin Alvin, nor the barber in the village who know how to fix up when fellas skull plates show in. Maybe the local opera singer who feel that black people can't tell if she's singing in tune. No. Nobody go care for poor Elsie. Not even the shit snake or the mongoose fleeing fire or the blackbird waiting for rice or the boy with the whip that cutting lizards into look their thick back bursting. So left to eat dirt till it pack up her gut, Elsie get mad like a jumbie in a cage. She, she hissing and biting people ankle when they pass. The butcher Raphael seeing her plight and fed up hearing her cry at night, fling some mercy her way. He let go a hose under there and wash away cockroach and scorpion nest and lump of cement with chicken wire that remained there from long ago way of building with mud and bush. From since Mr. Tom was a boy learning construction work in Tobago, it wash out worm in old wood from leftover carpentry wood. But Elsie refused to leave and she keeping the man from his work. Every time Raphael sit down to write, he hearing she moan. And she is family, a distant cousin, but still he can't turn her, he can't turn his air away. So he let go mercy again. He invite Elsie to sing jazz in the little Sunday band he blew in trumpet in. But she failed. Her singing was bad. Must be dirt eat out her throat. He try her in the butchery to cleave goat meat from bone, but she flinging blade like sorrow self and junking up the people meat. So he put her in the book he was writing. He put her under a house to eat dirt, but Elsie wouldn't behave. She vexed like crab. She watching Raphael cut eye and cussing. She wouldn't bend to the ark. She was too hardened to own way. She see men like Luke and the Coxman sax boy run out and explore. So Elsie want to venture out too. So when the old man put her to sit down, she's skinning up leg and cussing like old Hague. She tearing up half. She never wear shoes. Elsie will teeth meat out from cane cutter teeth. Cigarette out from Calypsonian mouth. Money out the reverend hand. It wasn't until Raphael buy her a sailor dress and put her in a Buddy Williams dance that she started to revive and act decent. Now she washing her mouth out with bacon soda and bathing daily with rosemary bush. Now she cutting her hair and taking studio pose on long stool. Now she become a parable for change in Raphael book. If she make Raphael realize that women like her could not be contained, they must run amok and cry out. They must stand up in Central Market and drag cutlass across their navel. They must pump engine and drive taxi. They must draw their own pension and capsize lazy men. 
who get a big like robot. Thank you for that, Anthony. I think I think it is apparent to me, and I think it will be apparent to anyone who both knows your your work and is new to it that the freedom you give yourself to be and, and then give all the characters to either explore or be thwarted by their own ends is a real gift in, in ever since you said that that big difference between kitsch, wherein you had so many kinds of responsibility to the frequency of magic, where your ultimate responsibility is to yourself. It could not be yeah. more different than it is in this moment. Yeah. And it, it's a beautiful thing. Um, Thank you. We have a question from someone who is definitely no stranger to the NGC Bocas Lit Fest, Nicholas Lachlan, and he would like to know, Anthony, what are you working on right now or next? What's on the horizon? Um, I'm always working on a lot of things at the same time. So right now I'm finishing, trying to get to the end of a poetry collection that I've been working on. All through the time I've been writing Kitchen Frequency, I've been working on these poems and I haven't had a, a book of poetry out for quite a while. So I'm working on a collection um, and then I'm working on a suite of, of poems for my father who passed away a few years ago. So I'm working on a suite of sonnets for that, which, also, which is also going to be part of a film that I'm beginning to work on, you know. Uh, everyone was I mean, beginning to work on things before this, 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 these events that we live in now happen. So yeah, there's a film planned, which is kind of exploring Caribbean fatherhood through the lens of my own dad and my own experience with my father. Um, and I'm writing a series of poems for that. Um, also, I am working on a new album with my band and we were just about to, to start like final rehearsals for recording that until um the covid situation hit so as soon as we have freedom to go out and do that again whenever that is we will resume we're hoping to record that this year if we can to release next year so i think that's it <laughs> i think that's what i'm actually working on that's enough i think yeah i'm excited to yeah. see all of those things come to the light yeah. so as we begin to, to wind down we like to end things up here at bios and bookmarks by playing three envelopes three envelopes <laughs> is our fun series just in case things ever get a little too heavy which which can all happen um yeah. we bring it to a place of humor and speculation which <laughs> are very topical elements in the frequency of magic so the premise is simple anthony will pick an envelope from one through three, and then we will engage with what's inside. So, Anthony? Uh, I think I'm going to go for one. All right. One has been very popular for some reason. <laughs> all right. And our social media assistant, Alana, writes all these questions tailored to the authors. All right. Question one. Your work seems to favor blurred lines, poetry, prose, music, spoken word all merging into music, into magic, sorry. What else besides art could stand to benefit from the blurring and mixing of forms? Wow, um, that's really difficult because to, to answer that, I think you gotta define what art is because <laughs> besides art, that's part of the question, right? Besides art, what besides art? Well. Um, I think, uh, I mean, maybe the teaching of art is one thing, you know, the way we teach, the way we teach writing, for instance, um, the way I teach at least is, is a way, uh, I, I definitely blur the lines in, in how I teach, how I teach writing, how I teach poetry, for instance, in that, uh, I do teach them the classics, you know, I do teach them, well, you know, the, the wall cuts and the, the keats and all that. But I bring in other things. I bring in, I might bring in Sparrow, you know, I might bring in some Shadow, I might bring in whatever, you know. You know, uh, I mix it up. I blur the lines, you know, and a lot of times I, I you know, uh, I tell them, you know, a poem is just something that defines itself each time. You're defining what a poem is each time, you know. Let's not have these strict guidelines of what constitutes a poem or what constitutes a story. 
let's just try to get something honest going. Let's try to get a flow going from what you feel inside. So I guess the blurring of the lines there will work. If that's, you know, if that's far away enough from art, I don't think, you know, it's that related. I think, yeah, I think I could get away with saying that the way we teach, the way we teach creativity is definitely a, a place where we could blur the lines. Um, I think we already blur the lines as people. I think the people that, that insist on lines are politicians and uh, uh, preachers or whatever. That's right. But I think the, yeah, I think how we live our lives as people, we are already blurring lines all the time. We don't see the lines, you know? Um, so yeah. I think I'll try. I'll leave it there. I like that. <laughs> that's a difficult one. That, that's a good one yeah. to answer because okay. you know, <laughs> many ways you could call the frequency of magic a poet's novel. You could call it a dreamer's novel, a musician's novel. It's a novel yeah. that obeys yeah. only itself, which is a rare thing. Yeah. It's an exciting thing. I would urge anyone who has been with us for this bios and bookmarks, we've left a link to People Tree Press's website and the frequency of magic and while you're there you can also check out kitsch which is also published by people tree press anthony it's been great fun oh, thank you thank you Shivan. Joy to share this time with you thank you so much thanks to all of you who have tuned in to the sixth episode of bios and bookmarks powered by the ngc bogus lit fest i'll be back next week until then please stay safe and don't be afraid to let some magic in. Thank you again, everyone.